Houses made of sticks, the rise of the wooden skyscraper, why more and more developers are leaning towards timber. Welcome to Roundtable. And a warm welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. Concrete and steel may well be the most accessible building materials, but they leave a very, very hefty carbon footprint. So, more architects are looking towards wood as an eco-friendly alternative, although it may not fully end houses of glass and steel. As urban centres grow, so does the need for more housing. The majority of buildings are made of concrete and steel. They're cost effective, but they also have a significant carbon footprint. 8 and 5% respectively of all man-made carbon emissions. Now there's a drive for more eco-friendly building solutions. Top of the list for some developers is timber. It's not new, it's been used for centuries, but dispensed with because of fire risks. But now architects have developed a more fire-resistant material called cross-laminated timber, or CLT. That spurred ambitious new projects for wooden skyscrapers. This one's on the drawing board for the UK. Norway has the world's tallest wooden tower, 18 stories high, although Japan is planning to overtake that by 2041. So, are wooden skyscrapers on the rise? And we can say hello from Helsinki to Laurie Hetemaki on the left of your screen there, Assistant Director of the European Forestry Institute. Uh, on the right, John Innes from Vancouver, Dean of Forestry at the University of British Columbia. With me at the round table, Anthony Thistleton, co-founder of War Thistleton Architects and Kevin Flanagan, partner of PLP Architecture, company which is planning London's new wooden skyscraper, which would, Kevin, if it were to be built, uh, be the tallest structure in London. Yes. We can see it here, you've brought the model in. So tell us, I mean, it's all wood, is it? It is all wood, all from the ground level up. It's sitting on existing concrete foundations in the Barbican, which was a, a project that was designed as a futuristic project in the 1980s. So in the 2020s, what we're trying to do is look to a new material and a new vision of how we will live in cities. Uh, the idea structurally is that we have a series of component parts that are brought to site. Uh, it's a very light material called cross-laminated timber, and the structure itself sits basically on the four outside piers of the, of the structural plan. And every bit other than the glass and the concrete foundations. Yes, everything wood, is wood, 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 wood. You wood. know what I'm going to say, don't you, both of you? Yes. Yeah, Great Fire of London, Great. AD 64, the fire right. in Rome, Tokyo 1600s, right. 100,000 dead. Right. Wooden buildings catch fire. This is a different type of material. It's manufactured, it's made in a press, the panels are exceptionally large. And of course, the fire notion really has a lot to do with how we create safe buildings for people to live in and escape from properly in an orderly fashion. The buildings and cities made of timber should be equally as safe and we're studying methods by which the material can be even safer still. OK, should is a great word in that sense, rather than actually is, right. because you're still experimenting to some extent. Absolutely. I know there are lots of wooden structures around the world. You're, you're a very keen proponent of this. What do you think when you see headlines like tall tinder, are wooden skyscrapers really fire safe? Well, I think, firstly, we need to address what we mean by skyscrapers, because I think we're interested in using timber at high density, which doesn't necessarily mean building 80 storeys tall. I mean, the, the global demand for buildings of this scale is not great. I mean, it's, an important, it's important to generate interest in, in timber. But I think where we're talking about um, fire safety, um, we know that all materials are vulnerable to fire. Steel can melt at 300 degrees, concrete spools. And of course, we can't avoid the fact that our buildings contain lots of combustible materials including the people that they house as well. It's really, as, as Kevin says, it's, it's understanding the way fire behaves and then designing and protecting accordingly. In, in doing some reading for this, I, I discovered, and you'll tell me whether this is accurate or not, that wood actually is less combustible in many ways or, or than, than a lot of other materials because only the outside would, would 
char would burn, the inside would remain untouched. A absolutely, in a massive timber structure, that's yeah. exactly the case. And, and of course, we all know that if you wanted to set fire to a log, you wouldn't do it by holding a match there. You wouldn't get anywhere you could hold a match for hours. You need, um, you know, the, 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 the timber itself does char, and as you say, it protects the inner, the inner, um, the inner core of the, of the timber. Well, we'll talk in a minute um, here in mm -hmm. the studio, and everybody can join in at any one time, uh, uh, about how this is going to be acceptable to a lot of people and what you plan to do with it. But let, let's go to um, Laurie first in Helsinki. The, the environmental benefits of this are, well, let's say on face value, quite extraordinary, because whereas concrete and steel contribute, I think, 13% of the global carbon footprint everywhere, um, Timber actually absorbs it. Yes. May I start with a quote from Winston Churchill, who once said that we save our buildings and afterwards the buildings save us. And basically he was meaning that uh, the architects and builders first save the building and once people move to work and live in the buildings, the buildings' qualities and atmosphere save them. And I think when we are talking about wooden skyscrapers, they can in the future shape our uh, feelings and, and how we see tomorrow. Uh, today, uh, concrete, steel, skyscrapers, building are responsible of 35% uh, of carbon emissions in Europe and 50% of the material use. Tomorrow, if we build these buildings out of wood, we can reduce actually the carbon footprint and the material waste. And in that sense, people who are living in these wooden skyscrapers would be more happier, happier to live within the planetary boundaries of our world. So I think there's really a uh, positive environmental footprint behind uh, wooden buildings. That jo John, John, I'll come to you in just a second, but I wanted, um, in the light of what Laurie said, to come to you, Anthony, once again. He talks about the carbon footprint. There's a building you put up in London, wooden one, Yes. Which involved, I think it was only 100 lorries going to the site, as opposed yeah. to if it had been traditional materials, 900? 900 for the, for, the, for the structural frame, yes. So, I mean, the, I think the savings when we use timber, are, they, they work the whole way through the process. I mean, for us, the carbon story is the most important because eliminating carbon polluting materials like concrete and steel and then using the timber to store carbon is essential but then we get savings in terms of pollution and in terms of accessing the site we get faster construction and of course the as Laurie was saying the people who live in timber it's not because they're happy about not just because they're happy about saving the environment but we know that people who live and work in timber have lower heart rates have better sleeping patterns Timber in hospitals encourages faster recovery rates. You get better concentration in schools built from timber. So all of these, these are, there are many other reasons why we should and, be And, John, you're, you're nodding at that one, particularly about the schools and timber and concentration levels. I haven't heard this one before. Yeah, that's uh, now fairly well known. Uh, there's been experiments done on looking at the health benefits of timber buildings, and they're pretty conclusive. So there are a lot of added benefits as well as the cost benefits and the sustainability benefits that have already been mentioned. Extraordinary. There is opposition to this, and it, it will come in the form of those um, interested parties who might lose out, in other words, the concrete and steel industry, and, and also insurers. What are the arguments against, John? The arguments against wood are, we've heard a little bit, fire is one of them. Uh, the resistance of the wood to decay. There are issues with noise. Uh, if you live in a wooden building and you've got someone walking on the floor above you, you hear them generally. Um, but there are ways to combat all of those. And there's still research being undertaken. But what I think we're likely to see is not necessarily buildings built entirely out of wood, but hybrid structures that involve both concrete, steel and wood. So bringing them all together. Is there enough wood to go round? That's, that's for you, John, since you're a forestry man. Absolutely. Uh, we waste huge amounts of wood under current construction uh, patterns. So places like Canada, Russia, USA, and then all the countries that are building plantation forests, uh, there, there is huge amounts of wood available. And we have basically a resource that is renewable. So that wood, when we harvest it, it will regrow. Depending on where it is, it can take 10, 
years, it may take 100 years, but it does regrow. Hey, listen, you guys in, in, in different locations, you have a chance to talk to our two architects here. Don't wait for me to ask a question. <laughs> if you've got something you want to put to them, then just go ahead and do it. But I want to ask you, Kevin, yes, first of yes. all, um, obviously it's made of wood, it's not made of concrete or steel, but, but in, in what other ways would that differ? Um, it, the stability system is a little different because the material is very strong in compression, very weak in tension, so it'll tend to move slightly differently. Uh, the material is so light for these type of high towers that we need to provide extra loading to the building. So what we've done is incorporated a winter garden. You mean it could take off? Well, no, not quite. It won't launch, but it, it, it actually is pretty responsive. So Because with, to do with is traditional to buildings, it's a question of they're so heavy you have to yes, worry about yes, that, but yes, with these, yeah. it's, it's they're, they're so, so light. They're so they're light. So light. You've got to... Which is great in cities because you have underground tunnels, you have construction uh, limits uh, is in, in terms of tube or subway tunneling, and uh, this could alleviate a lot of those concerns. Uh, but the architectural language needs to properly change with this material, not just because it's light, but because of what it says about the world and the living in cities. What we're really doing is bringing the forests back into the cities in a way that hasn't happened for 200 years, 250 years. So bringing nature back, and that has the benefit that people relax, that feel that as they do as if they were work walking in a parkland. It's, it's not just fire, though, is it? I mean, it, it's all sorts of things. You talk about the stability right. of yeah. something like yeah. this. I think they're planning a very, very big one in Tokyo. Earthquake-prone right. yep. city. But okay. what about what about? Great. This is a good topic. In in major centres like Vancouver, where there's there's seismic load conditions, Arabs engineers have said they would prefer to be in a tall structure rather than a low structure and a tall t structure that's made of a lighter material like this. So Japan is very interested in looking at these types of projects. They've contacted us. We have books that have been produced uh, based on the notion that the material so has a benefit. safe in an earthquake. Well, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. Well, I just, I mean, less just said that also. I, mean, I want to ask a, you in a minute about the fact yeah. that you don't think we should build quite this tall. Well, no, you said that it was a test case, which yeah. is fair. I mean, just on the, on the earthquake issue, I mean, yeah. there's, a, there's a test from some years ago where a seven-storey CLT building was shaken. CLT on being cross-laminated cross timber, which is, which is what, which is, we've, is, been is, been which is what we've been talking about. talking yeah. about. And, and what, what it shows is how the, the, timber, the timber actually flexes and absorbs the energy, so it reduces, it's much less likely to fracture and collapse, whereas a rigid frame like concrete and steel, it, it, it can't flex to absorb the energy as easily. So timber actually works very well. And I think last year, um, the American uh, Department of Defense did some bomb tests where they blew up, created explosions near big CLT panels and ultra, ultra slow motion video. You can see the way the timber absorbs the, the, absorbs the, the energy and it actually, again, works a lot better than some of the more rigid materials that we used With to. With your buildings in London, um, some yeah. of which go up to a particular height, I think of 30 meters or something like that, am I, am I right? You yes. don't think it's the right time yet to go to this sort of, if I say length, no. that's the wrong word, height. It's height. Well, I think, I, th I think the thing is we're entering a completely new age. And as we properly, as we, as we start to, which we're not yet doing, as we properly start to respond to the impact we've, that humans have had on the, on, on, the, on the environment, and we really need to, to, to work out how to, how to maintain a population that we've, that we've created, the 7 billion people who live here, we start to, to move into an economy of land and carbon. So we have to, everything we do is predicated on how much carbon does this cost, and how much land does it use? Because these are both finite resources in a certain aspect that we have to reduce the global carbon. We only have a finite uh, amount of land. Right, so, so, Laurie, I know you want to say something. Yes, I would like to uh, add something. There has been sometimes been a concern that if we start to build these wooden buildings in large amount, that it creates a problem to our European forests. And here I would like to say that uh, today in Europe, uh, about 1% of all the buildings that are over three stories are based in the wood. Rest is in concrete, steel and bricks. Now assume that we increased this share to 20% in the next decades, which would be a huge increase. And we estimated in European Forest Institute, what would that mean in terms of the round wood demand that would increase? And we came up with a figure of 50 million cubic meters, which is equal what France is producing every year, or Turkey, double the Turkey is producing and consuming every year. So we are not talking about big amounts. And at the same time, in European Union, every year, 
forest grows 200 million cubic meters more than we are using. So in terms of sustainable forest management and the forest side, I think we could handle even a great increase in... Because, because I think I'm right, Laurie, in saying that um, as more and more people move away from rural areas, they go towards the cities, there is more space for trees and our forests are actually, as, as you mentioned, uh, growing where many people might imagine that they were, were going the, the other way, shrinking. Yes, they are growing. I mean, every year we have more forest than we had last year. Fascinating. Uh, yes, I'm, Anthony, then we must go to John. I'm sorry. No, well, I can, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just, the, the, um, the, the Timber Trade Federation in the UK tells, tells me that every country that increases its sawmilling capacity has a greater increase in forest cover. Now, if we're looking to the trees... So to, the more you chop down, the, the more, more you there chop is. down, the more there is. If we create a demand for timber by creating more timber buildings and, and driving that, we could drive reforestation and actually make a proper contribution to, to global climate change. And again, John, you're nodding at that, but there may be something else you want to say as well. <clears throat> no, I think that's absolutely right, uh, what's just been said. We are seeing uh, places where if we create the industry, people see there's a market for timber, and they will convert land um, from, for example, dairy farming into forestry. New Zealand's a great example of that. Why, why, and this is something for each and every one of you, so you can continue, John, why is it if it is so good for us in terms of uh, our peace of mind, our sleeping habits, uh, saving the world, um, safety, et cetera, et cetera, why aren't we doing this at pace? You first, John. I think you need to ask the two architects sitting there. Um, we have a building here in British Columbia. It's 18 stories, 53 meters high. It is a hybrid building. The difficulties that we had putting that up came firstly from the concerns about fire and satisfying the fire department. There were concerns for building codes. We had to basically change the rules to allow the building to go up. So there's a lot of resistance historically to building very high or even building what we would call mid-rise buildings out of wood. But misplaced uh, hostility, this, would you say? Sorry? Misplaced hostility? I think so, yes. Um, I think it's based on a lack of understanding of wood and a lack of understanding of the wood, of the way that wood behaves. OK, let, let's, let's bring it back to you two guys here, because just over two years ago, we had the terrible fire mm -hmm. in, in West London at Grenfell Tower, after which certain new rules were brought in to do with, it, it was the cladding really that caught mm -hmm. fire there, mm -hmm. but to do with mm -hmm. wooden structures. And you both think, tell me if I'm wrong here, mm -hmm. that this was too hasty, that it, there wasn't enough consultation, that these regulations, some of them at least, should be rescinded. Now that's gonna meet opposition, isn't it? I will allow my colleague to answer well, that. I mean, we, we work quite closely with, with the timber industry in the UK um, as, as the legislation started to be framed up because I think you're right I think that the, I think let, to be honest the legislation was hasty we had a government that was on the ropes with Grenfell needed to be seen to do something um, firm and they went through a process which didn't I think adequately consult in fact we were told by civil servant, servants that it was a political move and not based on evidence as we presented evidence to 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 the um, to them during the consultation I think it should be rescinded I think the, 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 the real frustration for us is that it is, it, it, is not, it is not fit for purpose because it doesn't actually create the safety that it is aiming to do. It has to... But some people might suggest that you would say this because you want to encourage more wooden buildings and therefore if there is an obstacle in your path, best to have it out of the way. Of course. Of course I would say that. And, you know, there is a burden of, of proof on, on the timber industry, but there also needs to be some understanding of of the performance, the burden for us is actually to explain the performance and clearly demonstrate the performance so that lay people can understand more clearly why timber in most instances is actually safer than the alternatives. What are insurers saying? So, Sorry, I'm just you... going to mention there, yeah, please. that these designs would still manage to meet the present newer legislation. There was a particular design detail of externally clad timber panels that were load bearing and that was the, that's become the issue. So, you know, designers and architects need to follow and bring forward uh, and be consulted in new, uh, new regimes. Well, what, what, what but we also have to understand that there is a social driver to a lot of these concerns. Get it. Yeah. What, what are insurance companies saying about it? As far as I understand, they like the material. And you can go to AXA, I believe, and they have a whole page on how this 
material acts a lot better than would be considered a, a Acts have been one of the UK's yep, biggest insurance yep, companies. Yep. And uh, it has a, also a comparison, I believe, with steel. And of course, steel, if it's unclad, acts very ter quite malleably in great heat. And this material is more predictable. That's what I have understood. Now, there's, of course, there's somebody who does lectures, and it may be that you guys on Skype know about this, in which one of the pictures is of a building that has pretty much burnt down, but still remaining is, is a, a cross uh, timber structure on top of which is a melted steel beam. Oh, you're nodding your head, Anthony. Can I, can I add an example? Which yeah, yeah. Is, uh, the sad example of the terrorist attack in New York and, and the double towers. What happened there was that fire caught up and the steel that was in the frame of the building sort of cracked down, and the whole building cracked down. If it had been built of cross-laminated timber, when it caught a fire, uh, it chars one millimeter in an hour, and you would not have had that experience of collapsing the two towers. So I think in many ways, the uh, sort of a prefabricated cross-laminated timber yeah can be much more resistant. Al although I have heard that the central core of most of these buildings have to be made of concrete and steel, particularly where, where the lift shafts are. And in yeah. the example you give, people still wouldn't have been able to get out. Yes, You're so saying that's wrong? No, no, but in our case, we're studying it because we want But, but to... in most buildings, it is steel it, and concrete, the central it, shaft. Uh, right? not, not in the designs that we're okay. looking at. We okay. look at the buildings with Cambridge University that are all timber. If we have hybrids, you do not get the benefit that you would in terms of CO2 benefit. So we're really looking at you know, all timber materials. The oh, okay, hybrids okay. have the problem structurally that there's a change in the material over time and uh, called slump. And the timber and the concrete change differently. And that's very difficult to calculate, almost impossible. So for many of these buildings, the clients have decided after some quite study to try to make all of the building out of timber because it acts cohesively as one thing instead of having component parts. We know that there are studies that have been done in Brock, which is basically a concrete building, concrete core, slab, some slabs, components, but we're really trying to do it all out of timber because the benefits are there. The social benefits, the benefit in terms of building ethically uh, are there. I have to go to John and um we, we, it seems like we're talking about the future of building here. Is, is that too extreme? Yeah. No, I think it's the the future, not only of building, but the future of cities. And I agree. I agree with that. We have to understand that the world is changing, not simply because of millennials, but because of new technology. We have gas stations, we have large plots of land that are given over to these because we cannot build up above them yet because the the fuel is combustible, but we're soon going to be legislated to use only electric cars. And in that case, those lands and the volumes above, the, uh, the, the rights above, can be used for buildings. And some of these gas stations... I'll tell stations you what, 150 years by... from now, it's going to be fascinating to be yeah. around, but yeah. we won't be having me as the host of Roundtable <laughs> at, at that particular point. Um, John, let me, let me come back to you. Um, in terms of the mathematical calculations, if pretty much every new building in the world was made of wood, would we have a problem with climate change any longer? Would it solve that problem? The, the issue with climate change needs to be solved within the next 10 to 20 years. Otherwise, we're going to cross some thresholds that are really going to cause problems for ecosystems. I don't think we'll be able to sequester sufficient carbon in buildings in that time. What we'll be able to do is make a contribution towards that. So the more we can build from wood, the better. It's not going to be the only solution. But, but eventually it, it, it could prove to be a, an answer in stopping any further acceleration. And I, th I think the key is that it's not the buildings that are saving the carbon. It's the trees it's that the are saving the, of the And what we need to do place. is we need to grow more timber, but then we need to be able to, once the timber's reached maturity and it stops absorbing carbon, so, for example, a spruce, once it's reached 50 years, it stops doing any carbon absorption work. So you need to cut it down, store that timber for the long term, for example, in a building, 
or a piece of furniture and a then plant building. again. A wooden building, exactly. Yeah. So I think the, the point is, and I think you know, we've done a kind of back of the envelope calculation that if we increased forest cover globally by 0.15% every year between now and the end of the century, we could have been, we could absorb 250 gigatons of CO2, which is right in the middle of what the IPCC report from last year says we need. We'd have also created enough timber for a billion homes. But, as, is, but as John says, unfortunately, we don't have that amount of time. Um, I, I, we don't I, have that amount I, of time on this program. I disagree and... with the time. I think okay. if, the, if the industry moves forward and adopts AI and adopts new methods of, of uh, technology and building, we could build these very much at pace. Our populations are going to grow double in major urban cities of the world we, we, by we, 2030. Yeah, we need somewhere, so we need to, somewhere to live. To live. And, to, and to live um, acceptably. I, I wish we could carry on talking. Um, we've I, run out of time, oh. as, as the planet appears to be doing at the moment. <laughs> but I appreciate you getting up awfully early on the west coast of Canada. Thank you, John. And, uh, Aggie, thank you, too. Thank you very thank much you very indeed. Much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, we'll be back with another edition of Roundtable pretty soon, but for now, from me, David Foster, from the team, and from my guests, thank you for watching. Goodbye.